speakers have some background in this. And uh, I actually had a, something here about in the beginning and, and where I started with this. <clears throat> you know, in my first introduction with black and white photography was actually, the, you know, mostly family history. Uh, my family, my grandfather married into a family that they were actually photographers in Chicago originally and then in Traverse City. And so his uh, sister married into that family. So the history goes way back. And then my grandmother was an artist and she had given me some painting lessons. And my grandfather was a very avid photographer. So he was more of a uh, color guy, but I always enjoyed it. And I really wasn't able to do much with it. And when I first really got a chance to do some of my own was uh, my mother, I think got a Polaroid so one of the early Polaroids and the cheapest film was the black and white. I think the first was black and white. And so I got to shoot some of that and that was a lot of fun. But then when it really uh, started to open my eyes is I got in a band in junior high school and <clears throat> we needed promo pictures. And so we wound up getting a professional photographer and, and that was like, wow, this is cool. And of course, everything then was black and white for your promo work. Uh, anything that got printed or, you know, posters, everything was in black and white. And I pretty much, you know, was always interested. And then eventually I was on the road and doing a lot of work and, and uh, I was traveling all over the United States and I was just kind of getting bored. I was actually listening to a lot of blues music and discovering a lot of that, learning about it. And I decided, you know what, I need something more exciting to do and something I can do on some of these trips because sometimes I'd have a layover day and I'd see these great, you know, scenes. One time I'm driving through Pennsylvania and I just saw this sunset on this arched bridge and it was like, wow, you know, that's a picture. And I had started buying books and I had bought some used cameras, a couple of Pentax and, you know, uh, lenses and and that was kind of cool and I was having prints made, but when it really got exciting for me is when I finally bought an enlarger. And that was when, you know, I, I discovered that there was so much more to the photography and then just started buying books and digesting everything I could. And that's when I discovered that uh, there's these advanced techniques applied to producing black and white imagery and uh, that allowed for amazing control from the negative to the final print. So just for a quick uh, definition here, black and white is also many times called monochrome photography. And the reason I bring that up is uh, all black and white is an image where color has been removed either in the digital process or through the choice of film, you're shooting black and white film and it consists of shades of gray tones that generally go from dark black or light to white. Um, Ansel Adams said a good black and white image always has some pure black and pure white and good shadow detail. And the monochrome image is also considered a black and white, but I actually like using what we call the sepia tones. I use, started using toners. I really like the older style look. So it doesn't display necessarily shades of gray, which is the requirement normally for a black and white image, but a monochrome image can be shades of red, yellow, known as like a sepia tone, selenium toning or blue cyanotype. And in the darkroom days we used, uh, toning chemicals, which stunk and were real nasty. You had to have a good uh, exhaust fan. So as I dug into it, I started shooting concerts and it was a huge learning curve. And from that, I then, as I started looking into it, eventually I left Iowa. I was living out in actually uh, Rock Island, Illinois. I had been working out there for 15 years. And when I came back, uh, I thought I'd be able to easily get a job here and it was tough. So 
I decided I'd try being a photographer. So I started studying all of the types of black and white, which entail architectural, commercial, and fine art, which would be abstract landscape, you know, people, portraiture, street, and of course, an event and concert performance. And I was really fortunate because when I started shooting the concerts, it was very demanding. And, you know, at first I started using flash, but then what happened is, you know, that was a whole technology to learn and I was studying it, but I would get to these venues and oops, can't use flash. And I had a background, a pre-med background. So uh, it was in, you know, with, in, with biology and chemistry. So I really started digging into how I could produce usable work in these low light situations without using flash. So that's how I really dropped into it. And then, and being uh, someone that was uh, in the sciences like that, you experiment, you experiment, you test, you test. So some of the fundamentals of good black and white photography are composition, contrast, lines, tonality, patterns, reflections, shadow, simplicity or negative space, shape, symmetry, and a big one is texture. Um, <clears throat> so then you come into other subcategories where you have what they call low key effect, Low key photos are mainly black and white or of darker shades of gray. The small bits of white in low key photos draw the viewer towards the subject usually, or they're the, the main focus. The high key is the exact opposite of low key. High key photos are pre predominantly white and more blown out and lighter shades of gray. And <clears throat> black and white is really great to reduce distractions. You know, you can take a color image and try to dodge and burn, but in film photography, that was a, a major project and very hard to do. Uh, of course, when we got digital, you had a lot more capability. And actually we started, uh, I was looking on some of my Lightroom stuff there and I see I'm from the camera club back when we were having digital classes. Uh, Terry was a great, <laughs> great leader in that uh, part of our club. And uh, so black and white photography at times can reduce elements that are distracting in our composition by controlling the light and the colors by lighting and darkening and using the shadows. Black and white can also hide noise problems due to high ISO or ASA usage. And you can use this technique to convert color noise and make it into texture. And this is usually very powerful, especially in night photography. Now our new cameras are getting better and better and better and we're having a better, you know, low noise. So when you go out and, and you're looking, use black and white to emphasize the subject. Use black and white to increase emphasis towards that subject it's partic particularly useful with high contrast. Uh, you can use black and white to create mystery. It's not exclusively used to prevent the obvious. Uh, using black and white effectively, we can add some mystery to our photos. And we can use black and white to reveal, reveal hidden details. So with only black and white contrast, we can reveal details, texture, and patterns that many times are lost in color. Now, some great color photographs <clears throat> are actually quite simple and it's the contrast, almost like the picture you're seeing in my background that gives them their strength. Um, but many get lost in so much going on. So it's a little hard to, uh, you know, always see when we started, when I started in black and white, you would use filters. And those filters, if you wanted to lighten a color, you would use the same filter. So if I wanted to lighten red, I would use a red filter, but in the same tone, 
They're in the same, I would use that red filter then to also darken blue skies and make them almost black. Orange would darken them. And then you had yellow. <clears throat> and green was what we called the uh, false infrared. So if you didn't have infrared film you could shoot, you could actually use a green filter and almost make a pseudo infrared. So it, it, the beauty of the digital now is it's given us tools that we can mimic and even way surpass, um, you know, what was capable with film. Now in days of film, you expose for the shadows and develop for the highlights. Metering usually using a ratio spread like the zone system developed like Ansel Adams and it gave you the ability to produce a negative that you could use and then use dodging and burning to develop a, a good print. Using different films and knowing how to push or pull process allowed you reduce or increase grain and work with texture, uh, which could be used to create various artistic techniques. Now, digital capture, it flips it. You expose for the highlights and capture a proper histogram so you have a full range of color. Then you post-process that image to bring out the shadows in detail. In many instances, if you get a proper capture, you might not need much post-processing. Um, I know a lot of people have shot images and it's like, well, you know, they have to process it, process it. But if you actually get a really good histogram and capture the full range of color, sometimes it's, you know, it's almost in camera shot like you want it. Now, one of the advantages we also have now, we started shooting JPEG, but now we have the power of capturing your image in raw file format gives you the ultimate capability to edit what you want and will allow minimum noise, maximum noise reduction. And shooting, of course, in the lowest ISO possible will reduce noise. Or if you have noise, you can use it to create, create texture effects. Now, methods and accessories of capture. Probably your first thing to be try and do is capture in the raw file format, if at all possible. Expose with a proper histogram and capture as much color as possible. And especially for black and white, uh, a polarizing filter is a very powerful tool. I've had a lot of people say, well, you can do this and that in, in post-processing, but there's certain work I've done and I just see this little tiny cloud and clouds can add so much to a picture. But you shoot it with just a straight raw image. Yes, you can bring some of that out, but it really doesn't enhance it like it would if you shot it with a polarizer in the first place. So you can enhance clouds, darken the sky. And the other thing is, is you can reduce grain or glare. You can reduce glare uh, and it isn't only in the sun, even in overcast days. I was in New York and it was, uh, we had on and off rain and it was a gray day and I was shooting some of the waterfalls in New York on my way back from a seminar out there. And I went to this one uh, waterfall and started shooting and uh, it was like, well, it's okay. Well, I put on the polarizer and all of a sudden all the leaves that were on the rocks and around the waterfall and everything just popped. And it was really funny because there was a older gentleman sitting on a bench and I saw he had a camera and he happened to walk up when I was shooting and it was right after I had started using the Polaroid. And he's like, man, how, do you, how are you getting those pictures? He says, I can't get any of that to show up. And I said, it's a polarizer. And he uh, was a newbie you know, so new. And he, he said, I'm going right to a camera store. I'm going to, you know, I'm buying one. So it was another uh, great learning experience. And Andy, I'm still learning and always learning. Uh, the other thing is a graduated uh, ND filter. A lot of people, you know, really poo poo using any of these filters with digital now, like, well, you can in Lightroom, you can use gradient filters, you can pull in 
but sometimes it isn't quite the same and it can save you time if you can get it in the beginning. Um, I use the Koken P-mount uh, filters that are the square and they have a frame and you can slide them in and out. And I still use them occasionally. And I find that the graduated uh, ND filter is great for selectively darkening the sky and the highlights and clouds at exposure, especially, and where this becomes even more important if you're not shooting in RAW, where you have so many more stops of control, if you're shooting in JPEG format, that's, excuse me, that's where the graduated ND filter really can be a, a huge asset. And you also uh, want to, when you're doing the capture, make sure you're not clipping your highlights. If you're going in raw, you can push them over a little bit and it gives you more to work with. And in certain pictures, you want to be careful because sometimes what we call specular highlights are very important and you don't want to lose those. They will push your histogram a little over, in, over the peak but that's okay because you can use those or they actually add a lot of dimension to a black and white image, especially. Now there's a technique I use where I punch up the images and I'm gonna go through that and show you uh, some examples. But another way, now a lot of our cameras uh, have HDR capability in camera so if you use HDR capture, you can use that. And what that does is it gives you a so much wider range to work with. And you can do that either in camera or you can use HDR software, uh, Lightroom, uh, you use the Photoshop uh, <clears throat> edit filter in there and you can work some of the HDR or you can use um, I forget what some of the HDR programs are, but there's some out there. But even just in Lightroom, if you've captured, uh, ideally you should use the three, minimum three images, especially when you have, it's a, it's a darker image and you might have, you know, a lot of really bright lights. You have a very wide ratio of light to dark. Um, HDR capture can really, uh, you know, add so much. And sometimes using a variable, a variable ND filter or an assortment of ND filters where you can then make long exposures and bright light and be more creative. And you know those all can also be an asset. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me get a wet my whistle. Now, if you're gonna use HDR, it has some special considerations. And it's best to use a tripod if possible, especially if you're using in-camera processing. I don't know about all the different cameras, but in my Canon, yeah, I can capture, you know, two, three, uh, is it three to five? I think it's three. But when shooting HDR handheld, and it's, you have uh, some really darker ex exposures, those exposures get uh, much longer. And those images most likely won't align properly because of the movement. So if they're processed in the camera, then the image will appear blurry possibly. If you do need to shoot handheld, possibly try to lean against something stationary and hold as still as possible. Now this can be a creative style that could work for you, but if that isn't the way, you know, something you want, if they aren't aligned, and you want them to line up, you can post process them in your software and you can use the align layers feature. Then your image will be sharper. Many times using HDR post processing can give you much more control of the final image, especially in black and white. Converting digital images to black and white can allow you to shoot in what are considered poor conditions, normally for color photography like gray, dear, dreary or rainy days or in very harsh light conditions. It expands when and where you can shoot. You can be very creative. Uh, one good example is, uh, you know, during a very hot, you know, sunny, hot days, you've got all this amazing bright light, harsh shadows, 
that is an excellent time to shoot high contrast scenes to accentuate lines and texture, especially when the lights cascading on the side of something brings out the texture. And if, if you can also use it to develop in a, a false infrared style without using an infrared capable camera. On a hot sunny day, you can ride around in your air conditioned vehicle and jump out and take some photos and get back in and cool down. Or on a cold or gray or overcast day, the same can apply. Look for line, texture, and subjects of high contrast. But sometimes you don't always see them until you capture it and start processing, and I'll show you a couple. Uh, night scenes come to life or have a great sense of mystery. And this is where, you know, another example of when, you, you know, it's not always something a lot of people think of shooting but it can really make great images. If the object of, of interest, you know, is it the big picture or the details? Always keep in mind, what are you trying to see? Or when you look at a scene, oh, I see the big picture, but are there details? And many times I will go and I'll start shooting something and I start with the big picture, but I move in, I move in, I move in, and I start looking to whether, till I work my way down into the details. So you can, you know, be so creative. Plus, if you're an advanced image editor, you can move to Photoshop uh, or advanced editing programs and add to the sky. You can uh, pull in, you know, uh, create something from several images, subtract and simplify, crop and cut. So I believe the beauty of photography is that it is limitless in its possibilities. So post-processing. This is where the art and the fun or the work moves to the creative process and where you can develop your own style or you can use presets available in the image editor you're using. Um, most of the techniques I use can be used in most of the good image editors. There is also Capture One, there's GIMP, Paint Shop Pro, Luminar, um, you know, on and on and on. So whatever you use, you know, a lot of them have the capability. For editing on mobile devices, there are also many popular apps and some of that was covered in the former presentation. And you can research these yourself. If you have questions you might check with is it Rochelle and a few other people now? I think Terry has now uh, been quite active. So um, I'm starting to do it and it's a lot of fun. Now that you can also use these presets uh, that some are available as downloads or you can use add-on extensions or programs for some of the black and white like DxO Silver Effects Pro, the Google Nick collection, uh, on one raw, uh, the new 2020, in uh, many others. There are photographers that use negative films and also like some of the programs that emulate the film emulsions that they liked. So there's a lot out there. I don't personally use these programs or these presets because I've developed my own styles and techniques. I found that presets are hard, hard to apply for the work I do because so many times exposure can be so different from one image to another. I will make temporary presets and use the sync and copy paste and copy it and paste to apply to a group of in images from a similar lighted situation or shoot. Now I, majority of the time I use Lightroom Classic. Uh, I keep it up to date. And recently I've been using Lightroom Mobile on my iPhone and iPad and those are, uh, they're doing more upgrades and updates all the time. So they're getting more and more powerful. I use the photo uh, photos app for quick edits. And uh, I also, what I do a lot of times with that is I use uh, an app called Tintype. And I like some of the effects. I, I, I wanted to do some of that kind of work but the chemicals are so toxic and everything that I just, I'm, uh, I just like, I just don't know if I want to get into it, but that uh, Tintype, the little app 
is very creative. But what I found is it makes some images so dark that what I do is I go into the photos editor sometimes if I'm, you know, want to do something quick and I'll lighten and crop and, and get my image ready. And then I'll go into the tintype and then I'll pull the image into that and process it. I'm, uh, I'm, I believe I can do it with Lightroom Mobile, but I haven't gotten that far yet. And I'm a little behind because actually Lightroom and the, the apps, they've been upgrading so fast, it's hard to keep up. I was working with On One Raw uh, 2020, or actually it started uh, when they hit one On One Raw. And I was uh, hoping to you know, start helping some people with that that didn't, uh, weren't using Lightroom or the Adobe products. But I just couldn't keep up because the uh, advancement, the upgrades are coming so fast. And right now, I just haven't had time. Um, so my focus has been mainly on the Adobe Lightroom. And I am pulling some things into Photoshop, but I'm finding now the power of Lightroom. It's just getting less and less that I have to do it. If I was still doing a lot of commercial work, I would probably be using Photoshop a lot more. But I don't have to do the amount of editing and layering and blending. Uh, you know, back in the day when we started converting black and white in Photoshop, I remember I downloaded, I think it was John Paul Caponegro, put together this whole preset thing and these all these layers and it had like 30 some layers and you went in and you tweaked and worked all these layers and it got really confusing. You could produce some really beautiful work with it, but it was hugely time consuming. So now that we have you know, editors like Lightroom and uh, the On One Photo Raw, you know, you've uh, even the uh, Photoshop elements, I think, uh, I haven't used that in a long time. But for the $10 subscription, getting Lightroom and being able to use Photoshop to me is really inexpensive and it's, it's powerful. So for converting an image to just a basic black and white, um, you usually start with just basic global editing. And you know, first you should clean up any sensor spots and possibly crop your image and get it ready. And then you start working your way down with the white balance. And this is before you converted it to black and white. You're still working with the color image. And what you're gonna find is with white balance, a lot of times you wanna warm your image or sometimes cool it, but more, usually more so you warm it. And I'll show you some of the reasons why when I get into showing you some editing. And then you just work down through the tools. Now, <clears throat> you might try the auto feature. A lot of times, if you have an image that looks like it needs a lot of work, you might not have uh, exposed a really good histogram. Sometimes that's just a good place to start. Um, that Scott Kelby, that's a big thing for him. You might not use some of these controls until after most of your uh, selective editing has been done, like vignette, or contrast. Uh, sometimes it becomes a back and forth dance. You might do a lot of editing and you don't use the vignette or push the contrast too much until you've already done some balancing and, and then you might even go into black and white and then you might come back. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you're really working on, a, on certain images, you know, it, it becomes this back and forth. And after you do mo all that global work, next you would probably using what they call the selective tools, your adjustment brush and your gradients and uh, the tools to target areas that you want to add, subtract exposure, like light paint, sharpen and adjust the shadow details in certain areas. Um, <clears throat> these cool tools can then be used later after your black and white conversion too. So you might use them before, bring up some of the detail in the shadows before you even convert to black and white. Then when you get in black and white, you might go in and that same thing, then you may actually go in and then 
actually paint in a little contrast or clarity. So it's just working out what you like to bring, want to bring out of the image. Now Lightroom has presets for a variety of black and white styles. And, and there are also uh, added ones for grain, sharpening and vignetting. The grain is okay, but sharpening and vignetting, it's not something I usually use, I do my own. Some of you might have also added presets you have bought or gotten from other people and have added them to your presets list that you like. <clears throat> the beauty of Lightroom is it's extensible and you can, you know, get presets, put them into your presets folder, and then you have access to them to use. <clears throat> okay, once you get a lot of, uh, you might not have used the presets, but when you have that color image where you think you're ready, you know, you, then you move in and you click on the black and white in the top menu. And then you scroll down to the black and white controls and, the, and you, then you adjust what they call the black and white mix. And that is where you're getting the control that we had with film using filters. So you can lighten and darken things by the base color it is. I'm wondering if I should, instead of reading this actually go in and I could start to show you some of that. Um, but let me see here. Yeah, this is where you gain, you know, so much more control over the brightness of the former colors. <clears throat> and using these would be similar to how the photographers use color filters to change the shades, contrast when shooting film. I found that to get much greater control of the black and white editing it is good to oversaturate and add vibrance. What you're doing is punching up the colors and then you have more control when you get into that black and white mix. <clears throat> you can use dehaze to either uh, bring out those skies and darken them, yet you have to be careful using it. Or the reverse of that, uh, some of you that saw Marilyn's uh, one picture in the last critique, that's where she used it to also, um, pull it into more of a high key look. So, you know, in, in that, you have for a high key look to add or subtract the light and the texture. Using this technique and pulling back the clarity is great for an infrared or softer artsy look as well. So I've got some information on printing, but I'm gonna switch over to Lightroom and I'm gonna cover first. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'm going into Lightroom. So can everybody see all the way over in my histogram on the right? Uh, David, you may need to instruct people if they have a photo strip on the right that has all the people to change their view by either hiding the thumbnail video or just showing the speaker vault. Yeah, so folks, you might have to hide the thumbnail view if you want to see the right side, uh, which is where our main editing tools are at. So if you have a problem, uh, hit the chat. Oh, now when I move there, I can't see my chat window. So maybe uh, Andy, you can monitor that and let me know what's going on. Yeah, so, we'll watch the chat. Okay. So when I started talking about contrast, you know, the different fundamentals, excuse me. Um, Let's go to full screen. Actually, not that. And so here is a good example of contrast as well as composition, but contrast in lines. But yet, if you go in and look, I have whites, I have blacks, but I also have detail. I'm really using the lines um, and to make a striking image. And this is 
almost the pseudo infrared effect. I brought, I used the, the red, brought the red uh, in, I brought down the blues. And so that darkened my sky and it just makes that church jump right out. As far as composition, you know, you can go with a more, what is this, geez. You know, you can accentuate or you can actually do, what the heck? Go away, excuse me. Okay. Now, in architectural work, this is more a fine art type work. But when you go here, this would be considered architectural work, like when I was uh, doing architectural work for uh, builders and, and magazines and that type of thing. This is one for uh, a magazine. You want to keep your lines. You don't want the distortion. But you also have to have some detail. When this is in a big picture, when this comes up, you you don't see a, a lot there, but you do see the detail even in the shadows on these doors. So composition can become, you know, very important. Then you're using strong lines here, leading lines, vanishing lines. Uh, here's another one. Again, you, you know, strong use of thirds but using good vanishing lines and, and strong lines there. <clears throat> this is one where you're actually using triangular lines. You have the one coming from the left, but you also have the other uh, lines there on the road. Plus you don't see them that well, <clears throat> excuse me, boy. But even the power lines are adding more lines, which actually enhances that image. And then in here, you're also looking for shadow detail. Um, in this image, um, this is another cloudy day, but you really don't need the skies. If you had clouds in this, it might not, might not actually be as powerful an image. You're simplifying it and really putting the emphasis on this light pole, the lines, the, the dock. In this image, again, strong composition, but again, you're, having, you're using texture and you're making sure you bring out some of the shadow detail. You've got your bright whites. And of course, the fog is our friend. If you know it's gonna be, when you see the weather the night before, or you may uh, watch the noon, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a cold, so my throat's in rough shape. Whenever you see the temperature and dew point are gonna match, that's a good cue that you're gonna possibly have uh, fog. And when they say the uh, humidity is going up into the 90 plus percent. So that's something to remember. Here's symmetry. Use the symmetry in your vanishing lines. Here again, strong foreground element, but put in your third. You still have a lot of texture. You have great clouds. Um, you have whites, you have blacks. Here's your blacks up there in the window, but you even see detail there. Here's a good one for simplicity, negative space. So you can be very creative there. This. Great composition, use of thirds, texture, shadow detail. Hey, David. Yes. On some of these pictures, it's kind of hard to tell what kind, what time of day you're taking these. Would you be able to to let us know on some of that so we can get an idea of, you know, how much? Actually, this one is at night, or just at the blue hour. I think it was uh, right after sunset. So I was still getting the light and I was still getting uh, clouds. This image, here you're using lines, texture, reflections. You know, you're incorporating about everything you can get into an image. 
This one was uh, one of my bright sunny day pictures. Uh, this one as well, uh, late afternoon. Actually, I think right here you can see. So I'm thinking this was probably three or four o'clock in the afternoon. You can see the shadows from the edge of the roof here. Uh, this was an overcast day. This was a series I had in uh, uh, lens work, seeing in sixes. Uh, this was just a beautiful, actually a nice sunny day up in Leelanau County. Uh, this was a nice sunny day. This of course was a foggy overcast day, overcast day here. Again, nice sunny day, uh, sun right above me, night shot. And if I go into metadata, I don't know why it wasn't up. Let's see, 30 seconds. It have six, seven. So at 30 seconds, I'm getting a little bit of drift on the moon and the stars. This was lit from the lights from the library. This is the uh, train station down in Traverse City. <clears throat> this is out in Bingham. And this is what we would, this is what we would consider a low key. And this would be considered a high key and then your infrared effect. A little more low key. I wanted to get something in there. I, I shoot a lot of, of buildings and architecture. So I wanted to get some more artistic uh, pieces in there. And here it's, you know, you're just, you're, I love the sweeping lines and then the texture and the shadows. That's what just makes this, uh, for me, a striking image. Here, I'm using the infrared effect with the foliage. And now when I get into commercial work, this was a color image with, this was yellow, the background. But uh, for an article, they, when they, they do their main images, but then I, they always want usually some accessory images but they asked for them in black and white. And I never trust the photo editor to convert them to black and white. <laughs> so I do it myself. And then I also usually give them, let me see if I can get there. <clears throat> I, I want to get these clear and clean and have detail. And actually there was heavier shadows, but by using my a black and white mix, I actually pulled those shadows down a little bit. And then of course, this is an example of a home interior. And if I actually went into develop, if I go into black and white here. Now, if you watch, let me see. You can see here down in the uh, in that little slide out drawer where they have T's and everything. You know, some of that stuff jumps out. Uh, the red, there's red in there. The green, the uh, the T on the top shelf there. <clears throat> uh, the uh, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of the tea company, but they use the green and then blue. You can see that what I did is I just, I got a nice balance with everything in there that I could use. In this image, I can lighten the grass, I can darken the grass. I wanted to offset it. When I do an infrared look, I would probably go with light, very light grass, but I want the house to stand out so I can go in and darken the grass. I took my blues and brought down the sky so I get more separation on the roof, but some nice dimension in the skies. So now this is an example of you shoot the image. And this is the way I cropped and edited the program before I converted it to black and white. 
So what I did is I punched up the colors and I actually pulled down the clarity. And so then when I get my black and white, this is what I get. And what I did is I lighten my greens. That way this axle stands out. And then I even went in, actually it isn't showing as well here. Let me see if I, I actually went in here and lightened so you see some of the detail. But that's a good uh, example of where you start, then you go in. And if you look at my, now look at my histogram, I've got it almost all the way up to the top. When I shot it, I actually pushed my histogram right up to the right. And what you got to realize, you see where my cursor is right now, you see that little, actually these two areas, you have these different zones. But this far right zone is over half of the color for the whole image. So if you never push your images in there, you're losing half of the color information that you can capture. And that gives you so much more control. If you need to lighten things in the image, you're gonna have less noise. So that's why the histogram is important. Uh, this image, I actually am clipping a little bit, but it is a raw, but check that histogram out. You have to really, uh, if you want to have full control. Now this is uh, some of my infrared effect. And so again, a pretty strong histogram, punched up exposure, contrast, actually brought down highlights. You can see what it does. I wanted to bring that sky down. And then I actually pushed up shadows, brought down my whites, and I actually brought in some black. A lot of times this is where a lot of uh, infrared pseudo effects would look. Then what I did is I actually brought down the texture and then I brought down the clarity. This is what a lot of people would produce. But if you want that infrared effect, if you look at infrared images, they usually have that soft uh, focus look. And so if you really want to simulate that, that's what you need to do. We use, I used to do that in layers, in blending modes <clears throat> in Photoshop. And I didn't even touch the dehaze on this one. So then when I went into black and white, here's where I worked uh, this was sort of fall colors. I don't want to, uh, but here I'm just going to tweak it. Uh, you don't see much in there, but I did bring it down. Yellow has a lot of impact. You can see just, you know, how much change there is there. And for me to get some depth down all the way through this tunnel, I needed to have that amount. And then I, what I did is there was a lot of green. So that's where I bring up those greens and, and punch them up. I brought down the aqua and brought the blue back because that's my sky. I need to offset and that, that's what you get with uh, infrared effect is you get a lot of that dark sky. Now, I'm gonna jump over here. This is an HDR image that I shot and this was processed in the camera. And when I looked at it, I have a, a, one of those viewers. I looked in there and I went, oh boy. You know, this, this is, somebody may use this, but my layers didn't align in the camera because I jumped out and didn't use my tripod. I think I actually was in my truck and I didn't have a tripod with me. And I always, I now have a camera in the truck and I keep my other gear in the car. So what I did is I went back in Lightroom and then I reprocessed this image and it became a TIFF. So this is an HDR TIFF and there I aligned the layers. And so I held it, I think I leaned against the truck. I pulled it right up to the edge of the road 
But now I have a nice sharp image. So that's where, if you're gonna use HDR, you can produce a great black and white image. Let me see if I can, yeah, I can create a virtual copy here. Now let's go through. Now I've already got my HDR and I've really punched everything up. But if I go into black and white, I can do it this way. Or you can go over, here's <clears throat> some of your black and white filters available through Lightroom. So you've got your standard landscape, which is nice. High contrast, eh, doesn't do much for the grass. Punch is pretty nice. Low contrast, flat, soft. Here's their infrared effect. That's fairly nice. Your selenium tone, sepia, split tone, which is, hmm, let me see, orange filter. Let me see, I had, now why this one? That's weird, okay. But what I would do, this is where I would start and I usually don't use a lot of these presets. So what I would do is snap it into the black and white. Then I might even go back now and I might actually punch my contrast. Might even brighten it a little. I know I want my sky to be rather dramatic. I would bring down my highlights, which even gives me more dramatic sky. I would like a little more shadows. I wanna be able to see the detail in the barn. If this was printed as a large image, you know, you don't see it as well here, but when you, if you were to make this into a fairly large image, that's where that detail really stands out. It adds so much to the image. Then you have your whites, blacks. I'm not gonna fool those too much. Now I'm gonna zoom in. And actually texture can be fairly nice on this one. And I haven't even touched clarity. You can go with a nice sharp look. That's a nice picture. So right there, I've just done some of the basic functions. Now what I would do is go in the black and white and now I can play, I can lighten or darken. I would like this, the grass to be a little darker because I want the uh, this fence post to stand out. If I work the yellows now, there, see, now I can even bring those down, but it leaves enough of the highlights in the grass to give it some dimension. Oranges, I can now work the, you see the barn and the poles. So you can, you can work this to the way you like that. Uh, the barn is actually blue, but it's so subtle that there isn't much you can do with it. Uh, the aqua might, nope. So that actually is a pretty nice image and I think I put a gradient down below, let me see. No, it might just be uh, some vignette. But again, look at my histogram. I'm filling that, that image right up and I'm in black and white. And what I'm using, what I'm doing is I'm using each of the RGB channels, the red, white, and green channels to produce all these shades of gray. And <clears throat> when I talk about printing, where this really becomes important, you're taking this raw image. If you output this, and especially if you're gonna print it larger, if you output it as 16 bit, you go from at 256 at eight bit, at 8 bit, you're only getting 256 shades of gray in each of your color channels. 
If you go to 16 bit, you're getting 65,000 plus. So what that means is you've got so many more of those midtones and shadow tones in there. And when you go to print the image, if you also use at least Adobe RGB, which is a larger color space, when I print my fine art prints, I go to the complete, uh, the pro photo RGB, which is the largest color space. That file would probably turn into over a 300 and some megabyte file as a TIFF. But when I print it, that means that I'm getting all my shadow detail, and that actually even adds to the sharpness of the image if that's what I want. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's say I wanted to turn this into more of a infrared effect. So what I would do is bring down, I might even tweak that. I would then go back into my black and white. Now I will bring up my green. Might even bring up my yellow a little more. Work my orange. And I'm starting to get a whole lot more of an infrared effect. Probably another thing I might do is take and put a gradient on here and actually make that start with exposure. But I would bring that down to give more dimension to my sky and even add a little contrast. So now I'm starting to get more of an infrared effect. Now I may even come back and here I would uh, work with the contrast. I still want a little bit of detail in this railing. So that's where I would work that contrast. If I go too soft, I like the way it stands out a little bit right there. Now, sometimes at the very end, I may go into the tone curve and then what I'll do is I'll experiment with medium or even high contrast. And if you are used to using the tone curve, this is where then you can also go in and then even affect certain areas of the image in this tone curve and even get more control. But you really gotta be careful with it. But you can see how you can just manipulate it and do whatever you wanna do. So, any questions so far? Andy, you'd have to monitor the chat. I don't, I'm not seeing it. I don't know why when I switched over, it disappeared. I'm monitoring the chat and so far, I uh, only had one question which I asked you and you seem to have answered it to okay. my, my satisfaction. I don't know if the person asking needs any more clarification. Okay. I guess I could ask a question is, are any of you familiar with this? Have you been doing it? Is this is some of this new to you folks? Because we've had some great black and white imagery. Our last critique was just shocking. <laughs> we had some amazing work. I was really impressed. I see Marilyn, is Marilyn in there? Yep. Uh, Mary she's, Ellen said she's done a little bit. Uh, Mary Picard has typed in it. This is very impressive. And yes, I have done some, but this is giving me a lot already. Um, I, I have not typed in the chat, but I also have um, have um, played around with black and white, but I didn't ex didn't realize some of the features like the B&W with the different colors, what kind of impressive changes that made. Um, so that was a big takeaway for me from this. So thank you for that. Yeah, that's that's your big, uh, that's one of your most powerful tools. You can even go back to your basic and sometimes you can even just go and now you're doing globe, more global work here, but sometimes uh, this gets real crazy, but you can all this, this affects it overall. Um, so now what I'm gonna do 
Okay, so you've gone in, I've shown low key and that's sort of a high key effect. Um, you know, this is sort of a high key. Let me see here. Yeah, I didn't want to get too many images in here. Now this is where, if we get into portraiture. Hey Dave, uh, Mary, uh, Mary Picard has a question. Mary, if you want to unmute and ask your question, I think this would be a good time. Okay. Can I unmute her? No. I think, oh, there we go. There we go. Um, on the one where you had the axle and then you um, bumped your colors way up, I'm not sure what the reasoning was for bumping the color way up before you did the other work since you do so much of it in the black and white um, in, in the, in the uh, sliders. Well, that's because when you punch these up like that, when you do go into the sliders, well, I need to step back. History. Where's history? No. So is it giving you more, more in the sliders when you add that punched color first? Yeah, what I'm doing, I'm going in. So this was the original image. Yeah. And of course I cropped it. Yeah. But then what I did, I went in and what I did is I pushed up the vibrance and the saturation. Uh, I added some warmth because when you get down to, let me go into the black and white. Now you can see what I did here. I actually, with this one, I was sort of getting an infrared effect. Mm -hmm. But when you accentuate and punch up the colors, that means you have more control when you get into the black and white conversion. Okay. So if you look at this, my greens are like, well, okay, but here they really have a lot of punch. And now when I go into my black and white and now I work on the green, I actually, cause you can always go darker, but what it does is when you accentuate those colors and drive the saturation and vibrance, it gives you more to work with. So like that axle right here, that was a brown. So you see, if I like that, oh, yeah, yeah. see? And so this gives me, see, even the red is now the, the subtle, so I can punch it up, but I can yeah, actually give it. To see it. Yeah, yeah see? So you wouldn't have gotten that had you not punched it up first. You wouldn't have had that wide of a range, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah, I would have had it, but this way you have more, a wider range of color to work with. Okay. Now I did this, you know, I uh, processed this image more as a, you know, infrared, but let's say I wanted this to be sharper and I really want, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm a car fan or I really liked old vehicles and I want to see everything in here. And then what I might even do is even go in and punch up my shadows even more. Mm -hmm. Now look at the, what I'm getting in here. Mm -hmm. I can come in here and I'll take my adjustment brush, go into my exposure and bring up my shadows. And then I can go in and actually, wow, yeah. Whoa, look at that. So now when I come back out, you see, you can just start bringing out little details. Nice. And you can go back and forth. And then in the black and white, you're like, oh, wow, I wonder if that. So the red, wow. yeah, that's one of the colors. It might be eh, yellow, gives it a little bit. But yeah, you can see the, what you're doing is when you punch up those colors like this, <clears throat> now you have more color range to work with. Okay, okay. So you could not have gotten that same thing without doing the punching first. Gotcha. Mm, I might get close, but this, as I, when I started experimenting with it, I was like, well, some of these weren't really affecting the colors that much. 
you know, the, when I was in black and white and I wasn't able to isolate some of the things I wanted, but when I, and one day I think I shot an HDR and then I converted to black and white. And when it gave me this, you know, nicer look and everything, I started changing it and I went, whoa, wait a minute here. If I go in and punch these colors up, okay, then I actually have even more control when I convert it into a black and white. Gotcha. So and you're kind of the, doing your own uh, HDR this way before you go into it because you noticed that the HDR uh, photos did work better. Yeah, and now if, if I can use a tripod, I actually have been shooting in HDR. I have, sometimes I would shoot, well, let's say I, was, I shot this straight and then I might actually then do an HDR. Mm -hmm to give me a second image and then I can reprocess those if I want or use the one. The reason I don't like them from in camera is it turns them into a JPEG. Okay. And if I'm gonna wanna print this large and have a lot of detail, then I would rather have it convert to a TIFF and then I can keep it, uh, pull it in as a 16 bit and in the high color space and then capture, then you're getting all the, the uh, detail you know, when you print that image, it adds so much more detail. So I'm gonna actually go in here. Yeah, see I? Look at that, yeah. Yeah, and then I can even go in and add a little clarity there and a little texture. Might even take just a little more. Whoop, a little too much. Now, when I back out, if this was a fairly large image, you'd have a lot to, you know, when you start looking into the image, you'd see a lot of, you know, a lot more detail in there, more to look at. Mm -hmm. I know someone that's not a photographer, they tend to look as a picture as an overall image, but people who are photographers or painters really like art they tend to really look into an image. And it, these are the things that catch their eye and I think, you know, give these images more power. Yeah, that looks great. Yeah, and I was gonna see, I had, <clears throat> yeah, sadly I had this cold and of course I was, it hit me hard in the beginning and I uh, got way behind on things, but I was able to pull some of these in and I have a couple, I'll go out and get them. <clears throat> but let's move into portraiture. <clears throat> you know, this is, uh, this guy is, uh, this, this young guy was really interesting. He's one of the Elvis portrait artists. There, does that help? I see Ann looking in. <laughs> and, he uh, he came in and he wanted, I not only did his uh, Elvis impersonator pictures, but I did his senior pictures at the same time. And I had talked to his mother and it was funny cause you know, he wanted a full length and blah, blah, blah. But she says, you know, I really want something special. And it's really funny because uh, if I showed you the, the grouping of photos, you would almost swear from one post to another. He almost looks like a different person. But what was really nice is when this young guy came in, he was only, what, maybe 15? But being a, a port, uh, uh, what do you call it, tribute artist, he actually came in and did makeup and put on powder. And so he was pretty easy to shoot. Now, what you don't see here is there's probably five or six different gobos where I'm blocking light, sending light, and <clears throat> trying to really get a dynamic image. Well, one of the beauties of black and white, when you go in there, when you work with, uh, when you use orange, when we used to shoot models, like I remember doing, uh, I did some work for Travers Magazine 
and we did some bathing girls in bathing suits. And one of the girls had these, you know, heavy tan lines that didn't fit the suit she had on. <clears throat> and so I luckily had, you know, I always had a camera with, uh, this is when I was shooting film with color and one with black and white. So what I did, I threw on the orange filter because what the orange does is it eliminates the tan lines. And so when you go into this image, and when you go into editing, here's the power You have this control with the orange that you can affect. It affects the skin so nicely. And with the yellows, you know, I could work this because uh, it was in, see, I have some nice yellow light in there, but the oranges are really powerful. And this can actually save you a lot of uh, touch up and editing time. And this orange, it works those shadows so nicely. If I actually come in, take down the exposure a little bit, there, try to get where I'm, don't have quite the sheen on his face, but now I can come in. So you can really make these dramatic. So it's really nice for black and white conversion into portraits. <clears throat> These tools, um, you know, can make or break a, a, a black and white image when you're shooting in color. If you shot this using the black and white in your camera, now luckily a lot of them, they produce not only a color, but the black and white, but some of them you have to go in and use the uh, actual uh, like Canon software or Nikon software. <clears throat> I haven't used them for a long time. And so you don't have the use of both. You only get the one and many times it's a JPEG. I think some of the newer cameras are now doing them as uh, DNG files. So they give you the same capability as RAW. So, I'm going to show you another one here. I got to go in. The, so I got to go to Don Swan 2020. This is really I thought these got dry. Well, not the sugar bush. Commercial work. <laughs> no, that was the live stuff. Okay. Where's my, what's the file number? 0024. All right, what am I not seeing here? Oh, here we are. Okay, the color, the black and white. This makes his face, his hair jump out. These, uh, you know, that's a nice picture. But this really makes his face, his glasses kick out. But now here's, here's what I ran into. So where's 24? Right here. Now, if you look at this, I shot this. I wanted to turn it into black and white. Well, there it is. And you actually see the guitar. Now, if you look at my black and white, notice what I'm doing with the blue. I'm bringing the blue and lightening it way up. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go in here and I'll tell you what, always make a virtual copy. Now, if I went in here and just went black and white, 
look how the guitar is lost. So the beauty of it is when I go in, here I, I massage the colors. I go into my black and white. I work the orange, bring up the some yellows. I can work the reds. He's got all that red in the shirt. You can really, but what was happening is I was losing the guitar. Watch this. That makes the shot. He's the bass player. And with that blue guitar, I might have a blue filter yet in my kit. It's one I would rarely ever use. But there you can see when you're shooting, uh, you know, some of this stuff, if you just did a straight black and white or shot black and white in the camera, you would lose all the detail and, the, and you wouldn't see, hardly see that guitar, the bass guitar. So if you're gonna get into portraiture, you're doing anything like this promo kind of work, you know, these are powerful tools. And whenever I do promo work, if you notice, I delivered color and black and white for every, everything I delivered. And then you see here, that background, Look the way that brought it out, and I didn't even have a back uh, back background light. So again, now we had a black guitar. Uh, this gentleman, I had a lot to work with because he had the uh, orange shirt that punches him right up, and I think it's a really stunning picture. And actually, what made it, I think, is him with the sunglasses on. He has a really nice element of mystery there. And again, color, black and white. Oh, and then, oh yeah, Don. I don't know if you guys know Don Swan, but Don. And then there you go. Group shot and group shot. So that gives you a lot of capability. So now uh, Andy, like he says, uh, we met at a, I think that was when we first met, wasn't it Andy at that concert? No, we were working together at um, uh, the office supply store. Oh, that's right, the office supply store. Boy, that's, that's going back there. <laughs> that no longer exists. Yeah, and uh, but yeah, he had, come to this uh, show and I always bring a ton of gear. And I used to have a, uh, a gentleman who was six foot four. I called him, uh, well, I won't use names, but he was my pack mule and he carried my gear and was my bodyguard. He was a uh, military police at Leavenworth and nobody ever stole my equipment. <laughs> and he carried a lot of gear and he was uh, rather, he had a very, a lot of character in his face. And sometimes I would take pictures and somebody, oh, I don't know, I don't think I look all that good. And I said, well, stand next to get this guy because he's one of the more, you know, he's ugly and you look good. So I said, you're gonna look good standing next to this guy. And he took it in good faith. So now let me get to a real live shot. When you get into some of these concerts or really rough lighting situations, so I gotta go grinders, what, what is it, grinders, 2017-03 here. And I need 5756. Okay, right here. This isn't the most flattering light. And uh, I did quite a bit of correction. And I went in and even tried to get, you know, use my white balance tool. And okay, if I turn the teeth white, you know, will I get a good looking image? 
but when you have such a dominant color, you can really use this and you can pull out a black and white image that looks phenomenal. And what you're doing is you're going into that black and white in here, I'm using my color filters to go in and see the purple. Purple is my dominant color and it's very sensitive. But this is how I bring him out of that background. And I actually can turn this into a real nice black and white image. There's no orange. It's almost, look at that, no yellow. There is red. And then here's where you can be very subtle again. So Mary, when you looked at that one image and I could just pop that axle with a little nice, uh, very subtle tone, here's where this works. You can actually just massage this and get just enough detail in his face or you can smooth it out. So you can see, you know, how much you can massage this and turn it into a pretty nice image. Mm -hmm. So I've got several examples in here. Uh, here's another one, orange, orange man. Now I think, yeah, I, I corrected this somewhat. I wonder if I, one of two, let me just try something here once. Let me go another virtual copy and then reset. Yeah, that's the original image. So I edited it, I went in and processed, brought down highlights, brought up shadows, didn't even touch exposure, worked the clarity, but I also worked the, uh, the white balance. But then where the real work was done, Well, I have to be in the book. One thing they changed, uh, you used to be able to click black and white or see the black and white tools. Now what Lightroom did, unless you've clicked that and already turned it into a black and white, they're not there. So this disappears if you're not in black and white, they separated these. I didn't really like it because I have to do a double step to get the black and white, but it is what it is but there's the power. And if you look here, the red, there's so much red in there. That's where now I was able to save this image. The orange, I can actually, see I can work out even some of the shadows or I can add shadows to give it more dimension. So no matter what you're working on, Here's another one, orange man again. And nice black and white. So when you get into, you know, events and now with these laser lights and everything, uh, there was uh, some here, I'm trying to look where, yeah, here, green man. <laughs> And of course, this is my specialty. Um, I shot blues and jazz artists I would film for quite a few years and interviewed artists and, uh, you know, submitted to magazines and wrote articles. So that's where I really cut my teeth. And being a musician, uh, I just really had a knack for finding that moment where the capture has some great dimension. And uh, the one thing about when I went digital, there's a lag time that's not there with film. A lot of times, like somebody might be playing and like here, he might've brought that guitar up just at one point and then he brings it back down the end of it. And I know that when he gets it at that high point, it's that one instance where it stops before it goes back down. And that's when I wanna capture that. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
Now what I have to do with digital a lot of times, I don't know if uh, this will show it. I'm, I'm trying to think, I have some better ones in other concerts. But what I might do now is I go to high speed shooting and I might, I see that guitar going up and what I'll do is I'll shoot five frames fast because one of them is gonna get them at that possible high point. And then one of my traits is shooting at critical shutter speeds. Let me if I can get a, a billman here. Where I get this movement, I freeze the artist, but I try to show some kind of movement and action in the work that I do. So I'm in there shooting at a 250th at 28, but it's just that critical speed. And I'm shooting at 46 millimeter on its 24 to 70. So here at a 125th, I'm wide open 28 in the 70 to 200. But again, Purple Man and this, this orange, the uh, microphone was blocking the one light. And so I got this orange in there and here I was able to balance it right out. So there you can see the, uh, the power. And this can apply to, you know, let's say you go down and you shoot the Christmas lights. You might like a color image, but you go, you know what? You might experiment in color. Um, geez, I wonder if I have a Christmas, the Christmas lights, it would be December. I didn't shoot, I think, uh, 2017. No. Didn't do any black and white. Yeah, I'd, I'd, it'd take a while to find them, but well, we're at about an hour and a half. So is there any other questions? Uh, this is strong and uh, a great, some of the weddings that I've shot, I've had some really hard, hard shoots, tough lighting and color, just horrible color. You can't always pick your.